Every afternoon on this farm in Wales, a remarkable sight occurs. People come far to watch it. Fresh meat from a local abattoir is the cue for an amazing display of aerial gymnastics. These agile birds are red kites. They twist and swoop to snatch their food on the wing in front of the visitors in these purpose-built hides. Other opportunists come for a free lunch. Crows, rooks and buzzards are here too. But these are heavier, more awkward birds. The red kites playfully dive bomb them. Red kites are a success story, having recovered from near extinction in the British Isles. These harmless scavenging birds were exterminated as pests, and by early in the 20th century, only a handful survived in the remote valleys of mid Wales. But public attitudes have changed, and thanks to conservation organisations like the RSPB, red kites have recovered to about a thousand pairs across the UK. The plentiful supply of food here at Gigrin Farm can attract a hundred or more kites at a time. People really get behind um, the, the red kites. It's one of these birds which inspires people. And uh, well, it's an absolutely beautiful bird. It's when you see one flying through the sky, you can't fail to be impressed. But some of their former strongholds have not been recolonized. A bird like a red kite, it doesn't uh, disperse uh, very widely from where it's actually been born. So if you wanted the bird to uh, recolonize all of the UK, it would take uh, decades, uh, even centuries. To speed up the process, the RSPB has supported a number of red kite reintroduction programs over the past 20 years. Now Robert Strawn is leading an ambitious three-year project to bring about 70 red kites back to Northern Ireland. He hopes to get them breeding here by bringing over chicks hatched in central Wales, where the red kite is now doing well. At Gigrin Farm in Wales, Robert is joined by Damien Clark from the Golden Eagle Trust in the Irish Republic. Damien is in the second year of a similar red kite project in County Wicklow, but for Robert, this is the first time. These old silage pits have been converted into a holding pen for the birds they've collected so far. Robert will need to take care of these helpless kite chicks, transport them to Northern Ireland, raise them and when they're ready to fly, release them to fend for themselves in the wild. He has just a week to learn as much as he can about raising wild red kites. After that, he'll be on his own. Tony Cross of the Welsh Kite Trust has been protecting these birds for 20 years now and is supervising the collection of kite chicks in Wales. Tony and Damien will take it in turns to climb the trees to reach the chicks. Robert will support them on the ground, picking up as much as he can. Mike Hayward, a Welsh Kite Trustee and one of the project's watchers, joins the group. He spotted a nest in a high larch tree and hopes it contains chicks suitable for collection. Damien takes the first turn at tree climbing. To reach the nest, they use interlocking poles to place a metal hook over a strong branch near the nest. As Tony tests the branch, Damien gets ready. A keen sports climber, Damien has all the gear. If you fall out the tree, your legs are shattered, not your head. While Damien ratchets his way up the rope, Robert gets ready to receive the chicks on the ground. Damien finds there is a chick, but only one. They only take chicks from sites where there are at least two in the nest, so this one will be ringed and measured and left here to stay in Wales. Further up the valley, they know of another nest. 
Again, it's a large tree. The signs are good. There's a lot of droppings here, so there might be two in this. There's a hell of a lot of mess on the floor. And below. This time it is Tony Cross who will make the ascent. Yeah, two. There are indeed two red kite chicks in this nest. Tony chooses one to go to Ireland and sends it down. The other is measured and ringed in the tree. Red kite parents are not very good at counting. They don't seem to notice if one of their chicks disappears. They will continue to feed the remaining one and with no competition for food, if anything, its chances of survival are improved. This young chick has an exciting new life ahead of it far away. The first task is to gather data and to give it a temporary leg ring. They have this habit of lying doggo in, in the event of any possible danger. They'll lie flat in the bottom of the nest and similarly when you bring them down onto the ground that they will. Yeah, they kind of play dead, you know, they're, uh, all of the chicks which have taken out the nest, I think it must be some sort of defence uh, strategy which they develop. All of them, they just lie down flat and don't move. His ring number is yellow 205, is that 202. Yeah. 202. This is yellow 202, probably a male and the elder of the two in the nest. He is also determined to be something of a maverick. He clearly hasn't read the rules about lying doggo when in danger. That's the problem with raising wild birds. They don't always do what you'd expect. With one kite chick in the bag, they move on again. Robert carrying his excitable new charge. This nest is in almost impenetrable woodland, but the droppings on the ground look promising. This time it's Damien going up the tree. Are you happy with that one just on this side? That big thick one just below the nest coming out this way? But there's a problem. The nest is too high to reach with the poles. Yeah, one pole left. Yeah, we ain't got enough. We ain't got enough. This is fun. There's a branch out the back. They can only get up to a branch still well short of the nest. Damien will have to free climb the last bit. As he makes his way through some rather brittle branches, it's the people below who could do with a helmet. And there are two chicks in the nest as well. One is sent down. But there's something about this chick that concerns Tony. I mean, this one, I can feel something, where well, you can probably see it there. See that lump there? It looks like a sharp end of a, probably a leg bone or a lamb bone or something. They, I mean, they eat carrion, so, yeah, it's a considerable lump in there. The worry is that the sharp bone could perforate the crop and kill the bird. Raising red kite chicks is never going to be easy. At the end of the day, Robert and Damien arrive back at Gigrin Farm with their haul. The chicks go into their improvised nests where they'll be fed. Kites are primarily carrion feeders, scavenging on a wide range of food. Robert has a go at rustling up an appetising treat for them. Particularly nourishing for these young kites are day-old chicks a regular surplus from the poultry industry. Here you can see there's an awful lot of uh, hair and feathers and bones and bits of all sorts. Um, the kites that can, that can extract the goodness and nutrients out of the majority of that stuff, but what they can't actually digest, they'll, uh, they'll form a pallet in, in the guts and then they'll, they'll cough it up. This is Yellow 202, the feisty chick, still very vocal. And for the chick with a sharp bone in its crop, a bowl of meat with extra rabbit fur and feathers to encourage it to create a pellet around the bone and cough it up.
It's now the end of the week. Time to transport this batch of chicks to Ireland. A second team has been working alongside Robert and Damien. Adam has come over from Belfast and has been working with Anne from County Wicklow. After a worryingly slow start, they have met their target for this week, a total of 27 chicks. But a couple of them are still causing concern. This is Yellow 202, the noisy one who's always on the move. It's not unusual to get the odd feisty one, but uh, slightly more concerned, he's making a bit of a wheezy noise. So, uh, so what does a wheezy kite sound like? I'm like a wheezy person. <laughs> not a noise. I mean, it might not be anything to worry about, but it's just uh, a little bit out of the ordinary, so it just needs to keep an eye on. I mean, he's certainly pretty fit by the look of it. The kites have a day-long journey to Ireland ahead of them. It is absolutely essential that they have plenty of nourishment to see them through, so a measured quantity of food is placed directly in their crops for them to digest as they travel. This is the other bird they were worried about, the one with the sharp bone in its crop. The bone that was in the crop, yeah, can't feel it now. The birds are now divided up. Half go with Damien to County Wicklow, the rest go with Robert to the RSPB's Red Kite Project in Northern Ireland. They get an even mix of male and female birds, though Damien takes the youngest and most vulnerable because he has a bit more experience. For Robert, this is all new, and he'll have to raise them all on his own. The whole project hangs on their survival. It's getting late and there's a ferry to catch. Finally, they're loaded and it's time to say goodbye to Tony Cross and the Welsh Kite <laughs> Trust who've helped them so much. And then they're off. They need to make their way through Wales to catch the 2pm sailing from Pembroke Dock. The ferry company have arranged for the two vans to load first so they can be first away when they dock in Ross Lair in Southern Ireland. With the birds secure in the hold, the two teams reflect on a tough but successful week of scrambling up trees. It's gone 5 p.m. when they dock at Ross Lair in Southern Ireland. The kite chicks have been in their cages for six hours now. While Damien sees to the paperwork, the others check the birds. They all seem okay. So how does it feel getting them onto Irish soil for the first time? Oh, it's really exciting. It's absolutely brilliant. It's like a big milestone. <laughs> as long as they don't fly back, it'll be all right. <laughs> The two teams now go their separate ways. Robert and Adam still have a long drive all the way up the east coast of Ireland to the north. By the time they cross the border, it's getting dark. Finally, just before midnight, they arrive at a forest in County Down. For the past few months, Robert has been hard at work here building special aviaries where he'll keep these chicks until they're old enough to be released. The priority is to get the birds into their cages as quickly and with as little stress as possible. Right. So. The chicks have been in the van all day. In the darkness, it's not easy to see how well they have coped, but they are all alive. Next morning, 
Robert arrives early to check on the young kites. These ones look fit and healthy. They will be hungry too and need urgently to feed. Robert has something special for them in the bag that he hopes they will find particularly tempting. Squirrels. Rather smelly, long dead squirrels. The local forest service is trying to control these grey squirrels to give the red squirrel a chance, so these are in plentiful supply. Everything goes in, bits of fur and bone included, just as it would in the wild. Kites were often persecuted because people thought they took living prey, like newborn lambs or adult game birds. They don't. They eat carrion, with perhaps the odd live mouse to supplement but nothing much larger. Feeding them this morning gives Robert a chance to examine them to see how they've coped with yesterday's long journey. After today, they'll be fed through the hatch in the wall. These are wild birds, and it's vital that they do not associate their food with humans, or they may not learn to scavenge for themselves when they are released. This is Yellow 202, the feisty one that had a bit of a wheeze. He seems in good voice this morning. The success of the whole project depends on the birds' willingness to feed on the food that Robert prepares for them. He hopes he's getting it right. After he's left, the chicks still seem wary. They are in a strange new environment and may refuse to eat. But Robert's delicious squirrel recipe does the trick. If they all feed like this, they should grow strong enough to be released to the wild in the next couple of months. Six weeks later, the birds have made good progress. Their food is not chopped as finely as before, and the squirrels are supplemented with other dead creatures found in the forest or on the side of the road. This is what a parent bird would bring to their chicks, and Robert keeps himself out of sight when he feeds them. Even though they now have the plumage of a mature bird, they are still juveniles. They have been fitted with identifying wing tags and a tiny radio transmitter on the shaft of a tail feather. Only the thin wire of the aerial is visible. This will last about nine months until the tail feather is molted and the transmitter falls off. Release day for the first batch of birds. The RSPB has invited the press and local people to witness a landmark event. The first red kites to fly in the skies of Northern Ireland for over 200 years. Five juvenile birds are about to get a first taste of freedom. Initially they seem uncertain but then one takes to the air. The others wait a while, taking in the unaccustomed view of open countryside.
finally, all five are in the sky, soaring above the forest, a real moment of triumph for Robert Strawn. After all hard work which had gone in, flying away so well, you know, um, looking so fit, so healthy, uh, it was absolutely fantastic. That uh, every, Everybody got a real sense of achievement, a real buzz, uh, felt great. The other birds will be released in batches as they mature. The first few days after release are critical for their survival and Robert needs to keep track of them in case of problems. We'll be monitoring them with radio tracking uh, just to see exactly where they're going, to see uh, on the first days that they're not going to get uh, stuck down in long heather like this because in long vegetation like heather or bracken and stuff like that, um, a big bird like a kite has a lot of difficulty in actually uh, propelling itself up into the air and, and flapping itself out of the heather. Also in the first few days, Robert leaves a supply of food out in the open near the release pens. But will they find it? There he is, very good. It's a relief too that this bird can launch itself back in the air after feeding. OK, well, well that's basically confirmed that he's OK. He was down on the ground uh, feeding. That's reassuring you saw him take off well there, so he's in fine form. Robert can't resist having a look at what they've actually eaten. Yeah, so the, the kites had a good go at this there. You can see where all the feathers are all around it that he's been plucking away at it. And uh, yeah, it's a good sign. Uh, look, there he is at the top there. As days go by, the birds will range further away from where they were released. But Robert can still follow them. The signal from each bird's radio transmitter can be picked up from high vantage points throughout Northern Ireland. The stream of beeps on each frequency gives Robert an idea of the location of each bird. The transmitters also give off a slower signal if the bird's tail is vertical, suggesting the kite is roosting in a tree, and a faster one when horizontal, suggesting it's either flying or lying flat on the ground and needing rescuing. It's now six weeks since 27 kites were released. So how many can Robert still trace? Almost all of them, I can, uh, I can pinpoint every bird almost, this is with the exception of two birds, which have been travelling out a little bit further, and then they've managed to sort of slip the net, and uh, the, I think they've, they've gone a little bit further, so uh, over the coming days I'll be putting in quite a lot of effort to try and find exactly where they are. Then Robert found the missing birds, but the result was not what he wanted. The first time it was... Well, it was a real sense of shock because it was the first kite uh, which would which would found dead. Um, it was really quite sad, you know, to to find one. Um, it was just a scalp when we found it, so it was we didn't really know what had happened to it, and we still don't have a real clear idea what happened to it. So that was really a disappointment. And then the second low point was a real low, I'd say, because um, the second bird which we found dead had been killed. It had been deliberately shot. The signal from the transmitter on the dead bird led Robert to this remote spot. I came down here, climbed over, climbed over the fence, hit down into this uh, marshy area down here. It really is met, wet and muddy and uh, I was up to my ankles in mud. And then the, the signal was really, really strong over there and it guided me over towards the bushes there. And that's where I found the dead bird, the bird Jay. Bird Jay had been released only eight weeks earlier. Whoever shot it removed its wing tags before discarding its body, which was full of shotgun pellets. The police were informed and began a criminal investigation. People were saying how really outraged about, uh, about the killing of the bird and it really showed how, much, how many people do support this project and feel like it's something good and positive for the local area and for Northern Ireland in general. So that's, um, Although the, it has been a bad point, uh, there's been a lot of good come out of it and I think that should avoid the same thing happening again. A vital part of Robert's work is liaising with the local community. This afternoon I'm going into a, a local primary school and uh, talking about the right kites because the, they would like to become involved with the adopt kite scheme. So that, that involves the, the, uh, the school naming the kites and then we'll tell them a little bit about what their kite's been up to, where it's been going and that sort of thing. So you'd like to adopt a kite, so have you, have, have you thought of a name for what you would like to call it? Oh, lots. Has everybody decided on the same the name? Yeah. Maybe a name and a hat, is well, it? Yes. yes? Well, how to have something with Sparky. Okay, who wants to tell me what it is? Sparky. Sparky? That's okay. a good one. Yeah, that's a good one, yeah. So you know all the birds have got wing tags on them, so uh, 
So what was yours gonna be the bird? S. This is Sparky now. So you, you got to keep Yeah, him. that's your Sparky. <laughs> he wants to take Sparky. Sparky. Very interesting. Um, wingspan, five and a half foot. Male, release date was the 18th of the 7th, 2008. Then Robert and his colleague Jen demonstrate how they go about radio tracking the kites. Later on, Robert heads off for the hills to try to find Bird S, newly named Sparky by the school children. He heads for an area where he's seen the kites come to roost in the evening. Uh, yeah, it sounds like it's over in those trees over there, but the leaves are quite thick. So we might not actually be able to see it, but it'd be nice if we could. He's getting signals from two birds. They're both flying. Yeah, there's one, there's one there, and there's another one, just on the skyline. I think it's possibly N and uh, S. Bird S is indeed Sparky, and Robert will be able to tell the school kids where he is. That's your two, two flying. And flying with Sparky is the feisty chick that wouldn't lie still, originally labelled Yellow 202. So the first year of this project has been a success with 25 birds continuing to thrive in the wild. But there's a lot more work ahead to keep Robert busy. I'm tracking and monitoring every day and I'll continue to do so until the radio attacks fall off. And then uh, next year we'll be um, going over to Wales, doing the same thing all over again, collecting the birds, bringing them back to Northern Ireland, uh, into the cages, then releasing them again. And then the next really, really big thing for me will be the first chicks being born into Northern Ireland. So that's something which everybody is looking forward to. There's a chance it might happen next year in 2009, but um, I think the most likely outcome will be uh, 2010, we'll have the first chicks in Northern Ireland. Robert's hard work and dedication has put these birds firmly back in the skies of Northern Ireland, a magnificent sight, absent for 200 years, but not anymore. The red kites have returned. <laughs>